Hey folks, over the past few months, we have been looking at different ways of visualizing and analyzing climate change data. More recently, I've been really drilling down and looking at data that came out of a NOAA weather station uh, outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan, just about 10 miles to the east of where I live here in Dexter, Michigan, to give us kind of a sense of temperature and precipitation data for southeastern Michigan. More recently, I have been looking at drought. Uh, the drought is something that's been really gripping the world, uh, especially the Southwest United States and Europe over the past summer. Uh, just really shocking images of reservoirs and rivers that are historic low levels. Well, when I make precipitation plots for this past summer, our precipitation here seems pretty normal, right? And so a previous viewer uh, chimed in on a comment thread and said, gee, I wonder what the drought would look like over the course of the entire world. Uh, sure, there'd be hot spots, say, in the southwest U.S. or in Central Europe, but what about the rest of the world? And so that got me thinking that that would be a really fun project to work on with you all to try out some of the different tools around reproducible research on this interesting question. So what I want to do is take about 10 episodes or so here to engage in using tools from reproducible research that we perhaps haven't touched in a while, as well as introduce some new ones to share with you what I call my stack, my stack of tools or my collection of tools that I use to engage in reproducible research. So the whole goal is to download all of the data from NOAA to then aggregate it by longitude and latitude, and then to calculate going back, say, a month or two weeks or some number of days, to then say, well, how typical is the amount of precipitation over that period relative to all the data we have for that degree, longitude, and latitude? Then what we could do is we could calculate some type of statistic, maybe like a z-score for the past month, and we can then use that z-score as a color attribute to make a rastered image of the globe. We've done all bits and pieces of these over the past, like I said, couple months, but we've never really put it together in a single project. And so that's what I wanna do with you. So again, we are going to use a whole bunch of tools that we've talked about, like Git, we're gonna use Conda, we're gonna use something new called SnakeMake, we're going to use R, of course, and then we're gonna use GitHub Actions, which will allow us to rerun our analysis every day and then post a new image to a website uh, that updates the current state of drought around the world. To get going, I'm over here in GitHub. I'm at github.com slash Riffamonis. You need to create your own account on GitHub. I've got other episodes way back in the archive. I'll try to put a link up here for how you can get things set up with GitHub and Git on your own. So I'm going to post this off of the Riffamonis account, although I also have my own personal account. So I'll go ahead and start by clicking this plus sign to create a new repository. And I'm going to say that the owner is Riffamonis. I've got a whole bunch of accounts in here. And so this repository name, I'm gonna call drought index. And I will then call this a project to practice reproducible research practices while studying the state of drought around the world. And I misspelled practices, so we'll get that right. Um, I wanna make this public because I want everyone to be able to see my code. I'm going to add a readme file. I'll also add a .gitignore file. And so I'll plop in R here, which doesn't really narrow it down too much. Uh, but if we scroll down here, we will see that there is an R uh, template for the .gitignore file. And a license, I'm gonna put in here an MIT license. Uh, that is a fairly permissive license that really just requires that if you want to use the code, you got to give me attribution. I'll go ahead and create the repository. This then creates a web page of the repository that, as we see, has three files here, .gitignore, license, and the readme.md file. The readme.md file is shown right here. Okay, very good. So we have uh, a version of our project already up on GitHub that is public and that anyone can see. I now wanna get this down on my local computer. So I'll go ahead and click this code button, the green button. And to the right of uh, this code, this link, uh, there's a copy icon. So I'll go ahead and click that. I now turn to my terminal application. Again, I'm doing this on a Mac, but you could just as easily do this on Windows. Uh, Windows has a Linux subsystem that you can use very easily. 
Um, and you can also do this on a Linux computer. I would strongly encourage you to move your analyses to a Linux-based system if you're gonna be doing any kind of serious data science in the future. Uh, it's just the tooling is a lot easier to get a hold of in a Linux type of environment than say on a Windows type of environment. Of course, a Mac is a Linux type of environment. I am in my home directory. We know that because I have that little tilde there. Um, I'm also using Bash. The default for Mac is ZSH. Um, I'm using Bash because that's what I've always used and I've never really felt a reason to change things. Uh, that being said, when you get a new Mac, uh, the default is ZSH. And so it takes a little bit of figuring out to go back to Bash. So maybe at some point I'll switch to ZSH, but for now, we'll stick with this. I'm gonna go ahead and put my project directory on my desktop so it's easier for me to find. I'll go ahead then and do CD desktop to change directories to the desktop. I can then use the git functions uh, to go ahead and get that down. So I can show you what I'm using. I'll go ahead and do git hyphen hyphen version. And this is the version of Git that comes with the Apple computer 2.32.1. I think this is a fairly recent version of Git. So I'm pretty happy with that. I don't think there's gonna be any real meaningful differences between what I might be able to install using something like Homebrew versus what I already have here on my computer. Great. So to get the project from GitHub down onto my laptop, I can start out by doing git clone and then command V to paste in the link that I copied when I was on the website. As it says in the dialogue here, it clones into drought index, creating that directory on my computer. And so now I can do CD drought index and I can do LS and I see the license and the readme file here in drought index. So I wanna orient you to a couple things here that you may have forgotten since the last time I talked a lot about Git. So on my computer, I have things set up so that I have the branch that I'm on um, put in parentheses next to the directory name, right? So I'm on the main branch uh, and this is green. And so green says that everything is committed. Uh, we'll see that this will change from green to red. Red means that there's things that still need to be committed that aren't being tracked or haven't been updated with the repository. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna go off of the main branch. I might before the whole project is done. So we'll typically see this listed as main. The other thing you'll notice is that I have two files here, license and readme.md, uh, but there were three, right? There was a dot get ignore. And so a little bit of trivia to know is that if a file name starts with a period, like dot get ignore, it's gonna be hidden here. What you could do is ls hyphen a, and now you see all of the hidden files those files that start with the period, as well as license and readme, right? So we see .git. This is a directory that makes the directory a Git repository. You don't want to touch that. And then we have .git ignore, which tells Git what file types to ignore. And of course we have the license and the readme. Over the course of this project, I'm going to mainly be using a tool called Visual Studio Code. Um, you've seen me use this in previous episodes. It's a tool that I'm trying to get to learn and uh, kind of, I don't know, figure out how to use. It's an alternative to RStudio. I don't know that it's better or worse, it's, it's different. And I'm trying to learn it and people seem interested in kind of learning along with me. So what I can do is I have a command line tool install called code. So I can do code space period. This then will open up my drought index into virtual studio code. And you can see here that I've got the dot get ignore uh, with all the different things that it's going to ignore. Uh, my license, right? And so copyright 2022, Rifamonis. Maybe I'll, here I'll put my name. So Patrick D. Schloss, I'll save that. Uh, and then my readme, uh, I'll go ahead and kind of reformat this a little bit. So I'll do readme as the title. And so this is a project, uh, I'll say a repository uh, for a project to practice reproducible research practices while studying the state of drought around the world. Okay, simple enough, I'll go ahead and save that. Uh, we might add more information to this as we go along. One of the cool things that you'll already see here is that in the Explorer here in Virtual Studio Code, there's some M's here. And so that tells me that those files have been modified. Um, I can use various tooling over here like Git Lens and GitHub. Um, but I'm not super familiar with how to use those and I don't really wanna spend a lot of time messing around with those just yet. So one thing that I can do would be control back tick. That is the key um, below the escape key on my keyboard. So that will open a terminal then on the right side of my screen. I can then right click on the word terminal and say move panel to bottom. 
And so that then will move my terminal to the bottom. And so I think this will maybe make for a little bit better viewing experience for you all. Instead of having it off on the right, I can have it down below. And then I have everything vertical and I don't have the screen too horribly spread out. So again, we see here very much what I had here. So again, if I do LS, I see my license and my readme. If I do get status, I see that I've modified the license and the readme. I'll go ahead and do a git add on license and readme. I now go to this like dark green color. So it's, it's added. If I do git status, I see that I've modified those and they've been, those changes have been added to the repository. So they're ready to be committed. I can then do git commit and I'll say customize uh, default files. And now I'm back to green again, if I do git status and I'm ready to push. So I'll do a git push and that's then pushed up to GitHub. If I come back to GitHub and go ahead and refresh the screen, I now see that I have customized the default files um, for both the license and the readme and that my readme file here has been modified. Very good. We've basically gone around the world as, it, as it's called, where we created the repository, we pulled it down to my local computer, we made some changes, and then we pushed it up. What that means then is that everything is firing on all cylinders for using version control with our project so that we can make modifications on our local computer and get it up onto GitHub. Again, uh, this has a variety of different purposes. One being that this will make it easier for us to then get this content up onto its own web page. GitHub has this feature called GitHub Pages. Uh, if you look at my Riffamonas website, that's all hosted on GitHub. Uh, so we'll do the same type of thing for the final product that we're working on. Also, a big part of reproducibility is transparency. And so by making all my code publicly available to you and to anybody else, um, you can then get that code yourselves and use it and muck around with it and riff on it, right? Uh, to do your own project. So the next thing I wanna do is go ahead and start building out our project to add the software that we are going to be using. And so a number of episodes back, I talked about a cool tool called Conda and its friend Mamba. <laughs> uh, and so Conda and Mamba come to us from the Python world, but you can really use them with any type of command line tools like R, right? Cool. So we are going to create an environment for this project that I'll call Drought that we will be able to dis dictate what uh, tools we want installed uh, for our analysis. So I'll go ahead and create a new file that I'll call environment.yml. And so this now is my environment file that I can use to create a Conda environment. And so the first thing I'll do is name and I'll then say drought. And so this is written in JSON format. And so we'll then do channels. So I'll go ahead and then create a list of different channels that I want to include um, to basically tells Conda and Mamba where to look to find software that I want to install. And so I'll do Conda Forge, I'll do base, and then I'll do R. And now I need to give it dependencies. So I'll do dependencies. And I'll do the same type of thing, uh, except then I need to give it the name of the software that I want to install. So R that I know I'll be using is R hyphen base. And we'll also then do R hyphen tidyverse. And we can also then put in the version that we want, but I'm not totally sure the version I want. So I'm gonna go ahead and build this environment with R base and R tidyverse. It'll tell me then what versions it's installing. And so then I'll update this file um, to, so we can set the version that we want. Okay, so I'll go ahead and save that. I can then do mamba env create and then I'll do hyphen f environment.yml. So again, this is mamba environment create, and then I'm give it the name of the file, and it will then install these two dependencies for me. Great, so it's created the environment for me called drought, and I can then do conda env list. I see that we've got this drought um, environment that I can then activate, as it says up above with conda activate drought. And again, if I do conda env list, I now see that drought has the star indicating that that environment is um, activated. I can also then do echo dollar sign path. And it then tells me that the first thing in the path, the first place that it's going to be looking for programs is in my drought environment. If I go back up further, I can see what exactly was installed. And so these are alphabetized. So I'm looking for R hyphen base. 
and let's see, our base is right here, and it's actually using 4.1.3, so it's using a slightly older version than the, what I've actually got installed on my computer already. Uh, so I currently have 4.2.1, I think it is, um, and so we know that the difference uh, between 4.1.3 and 4.2.1 is very small, um, but one of the differences has to do with um, the, the base R pipe character and the ability to basically put the uh, data flowing through the pipeline into a specified position. Uh, I'm not gonna be using the base R pipe, so I'm not really super concerned about this difference in the versions. But again, the value of using something like Conda uh, is that I can then specify the versions I want, right? So R base, I can then put up here uh, equals 4.1.3. And so if I scroll back down to R hyphen tidyverse here, uh, that's 1.3.2, 1 1.3.2, save that. So I'm going to go ahead and for the time being, I'm going to remove the environment and then recreate it with those versions specified just to make sure everything works. So again, I can do mamba env remove hyphen hyphen name drought. Ah, and I'm in the drought environment, so I can't remove an environment I'm in. So to get out of the environment, again, I need to do conda deactivate. And again, now I can do the mamba env remove to remove that drought environment. It's removing all those packages. Again, if I then do conda env list, oh, if I do conda env list, um, I now see that that drought environment is gone. But again, I can go back through my previous commands looking for mamba env create hyphen f environment dot yml. And this will then reload uh, a drought environment with those two versions of our base and our tidyverse. And again, I can then do conda activate drought. And again, if I do conda env list, oh, I can't spell that for some reason, conda env list, I now see I'm in drought. And if I do r I see that I'm using our version 4.1.3. And so again, this is back from March rather than the June version. So I know that it's using the right version I wanted. I can also do .lib paths uh, to get the paths that it's looking for libraries in. And so it's looking for all of my R libraries in my Miniconda environment drought lib R library, right? And so then I can do library uh, tidyverse and I now have those tools like ggplot2, per, deplier, tibble, tidyr, readr, all those great tools at my disposal for uh, this project, right? Cool. So I am going to go ahead and quit out of R now because I'm not gonna do anything in R today. And I can again do conda deactivate. Again, if I do conda env list, I see that I've got my drought environment here. It's not activated, but when I come back to this next time, um, I will be able to activate that. Very good. So again, if I look in my directory, I see that I've got my license, my readme, my environment.yml. I'd like to go ahead and create a couple other directories to help me to organize this project. So I'll go ahead and make a few directories. So I'll make a code directory, and I'll go ahead and make a data directory, and I'll go ahead and make a visuals uh, directory. And you'll see now up in my Explorer tab, I've got code, data, and visuals. I need to go ahead and put something in there because if I do get status, I see the only thing not tracked is environment.yaml. It doesn't care about code, data, or visuals because there's nothing in there to track. So what I'm gonna do is use the touch function to go ahead and touch a readme file in those three different directories so that I can then commit those three different readme files, even if they're blank, which will then help me to preserve the directory structure, right? So again, I can then do touch code forward slash readme dot md data readme dot md and visuals readme dot md, right? And now if I do get status, I see I've got uh, code data environment and visuals all set to be committed uh, and added to my repository. I'm gonna do this in two steps. I'm gonna go ahead and add the environment. So I'll do git add environment.yaml, uh, and then I'll do git commit, and I'll do create initial drought environment. Uh, I misspelled that, 
So if I want, I can go ahead and do git commit hyphen hyphen amend. And let's see, environment, okay. I'll save that and quit out of there. So I just used nano to edit the commit message. No doubt there are far easier tools to do that with Visual Studio Code here. Um, maybe we'll get to that in another episode, but for now, I want to get everything committed and moved along so we can get to the next episode. Again, now if I do git status, I see that that environment file has been committed and now I've got data, code, and visuals um, that need to be committed as well. So again, I can then do git add and I'm going to do git add period. So git add period will commit everything in those three directories. That's often kind of dangerous. Um, so be careful, <laughs> right? So I'll do git add period. Uh, and if I do git status, I now see that I've added those three files. I'm actually going to add um, a data directory to my .git ignore file because I don't wanna save those big files that are gonna be in the data directory to my repository, okay? So let's go ahead and commit these. So we can do git commit and I'll do add project organization. Right, and now I'm going to modify my .git ignore file, right? And so to do that, I will come up to the top here and I will do data forward slash and save that. And so now we're going to ignore anything that happens in that data directory, right? And again, if I do get status, I see that um, the .git ignore file has been modified. And so now I can do git add .git ignore, git commit, and I'll say ignore uh, data files. All right. So if I were to say touch uh, data forward slash test.txt, I can then do ls data, right? And I see that I've got test.txt, but you'll notice my main here is green, right? And if I do get status, I see I don't have anything that needs to be committed, even though I've got test.txt, right? And that's again because I modified the dot get ignore file. And so we're going to be downloading in the next episode a really large file that I don't want to have committed uh, to my repository and pushed up to GitHub because GitHub kind of limits the size of your repositories and I don't want anything too uh, gnarly and large pushed up to GitHub. All right, so I will go ahead and remove data test txt and I will then go ahead and do a git push to push everything up to GitHub. Now, if you wanna learn more about how we can download files in a reproducible way, in an automated way, you wanna be sure to check out the next episode, which I will show a link to over here on my right. Be sure to check out that next video as we process through uh, the, working on this project to create a global map of a drought index. Well, tell your friends about what we're doing here on this cool new project, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.